Hello, teachers and students of Yunnan University. Yunnan Da Shui, Telao Shi Men, Tung Shi Men, Da Jia Hao. Apologies for my clumsy pronunciation in Chinese. Um, although the questions related to um, language contact that it raises are intimately connected to the topic I'm talking about today, which relates to how English went from a peripheral peasant tongue to the global language and um, what this meteoric rise means for, the, for English language teaching today and for the social consequences that English as a world language has. Let's start by exploring the global language system. I'm drawing here on the work of, uh, of um, Dutch sociologist Abraham de Swan, who in 2001 conceived of the global language system as a pyramid. And by the global language system, he refers to those 6,000 to 7,000 languages in the world, of which the vast majority uh, in the order of 99% um, are peripheral languages. By peripheral languages, he means they are small languages, they are spoken only by a small number of people, they're typically oral languages. Um, if they have writing systems, they are not widely used for wider communication. So really local languages within specific communities. And that's the huge layer of those 6,000 to 7,000 languages. Most of them are peripheral languages. And above this huge layer of um, peripheral languages sits um, a smaller layer of central languages. Central languages are languages that have some official role within a state or a polity in the media, in education. And there may be around a hundred of those um, central languages. And above those central languages sit a handful of super central languages that are really widely used across states in international communication um, or by very big states and that have roles across domains from um, the personal to the public, from um, economy to politics, from um, the state to the media and so on and so forth. Super central languages, as I said, a handful would be um, the languages of the United Nations, for instance. And above all these languages sits yet another, la another layer. And that other layer, note the singular here, is made up of one single language. So whereas we have plural for all the um, peripheral, central, and supercentral languages, the hypercentral language of globalization is said to be English. So English sits at the very top of the pyramid as a language that is used across the globe um, and in all kinds of functions and domains. And um, indeed, I think everyone, you know, all of us have had the experience that English is kind of inescapable. The example that I've got here is of, um, of graffiti on a shrine in a very remote part of um, Iran. I hiked there a couple of years ago. And um, this is a place far in the mountains that is only accessible on foot. And so you get there after a couple of hours walking journey. And um, as you know, Iran has been under sanctions for um, a long time. So it feels like a fairly remote country in the global system. And then within this country, you have um, a fairly remote part that, as I said, is only accessible to foot uh, by foot. And you get to that shrine and um, what do you see? English graffiti. So um, English is really everywhere. And um, when we sort of all feel, and, and you know, I mean, all of us um, who've gone through an education system, of course, know other pressures to learn English. So English is 
ubiquitous wherever you are on this globe. And um, when we see that ubiquity of English and that overbearing dominant status as the hypercentral single language on top of the pyramid, it is easy to forget that um, not so long ago, English actually was at the very bottom of the pyramid and was a peripheral language and a peasant tongue. Let me take you back about 500, less than 500 years. And um, less than 500 years ago, English was only spoken in a small corner of the globe in um, what is today England. And um, so only a part of the British Isles. It wasn't even spoken everywhere in the British Isles on the far western fringe of Europe. So really geographically isolated small language that was actually worth nothing as um, John Florio, um, Renaissance educator, linguist, translator, poet, of the time wrote. Um, he wrote about English, that English is a language that why a language that does you good in England. But once you're past Dover, and let me just say Dover is um, down here, the port of Dover that connects um, England to the continent. But once you're past Dover, it is worth nothing. And um, we see that today, and I think it's it, it almost seems unbelievable that this English that to us seems like everything and all important to get to any position anywhere in life, um, wherever we are, was such a peripheral and small language. At the time it was spoken by two to four million people. That's the inhabitants of England at the time. And Within less than 500 years, the number of English speakers has exploded. It has exploded from those two to four million to 1.4 billion. That's a 700 fold increase in over a couple of centuries. And um, obviously that did not happen by natural propagation. Um, it happened through a system of spread. And part of what I want to talk about is, of course, how English became this linguistic super spreader in um, the language of our time. Many of you will be familiar with Kahru's circle model, um, uh, American scholar Raj Kahru, in 1992, so 40 years ago, um, set of world English is that there are basically, or of global English, that there are basically three types of Englishes, that there is um, the English of the inner circle, and by inner circle, he referred to countries such as the UK, US, Australia, where English is spoken by the majority of the population as um, a first or native language and where it is pretty much the dominant uh, language. And then he said on that inner circle was ringed by an outer circle of countries where English was used as an official language in the public space, but alongside other languages, other national languages, and the examples he used um, for countries in the outer circle were India, um, Nigeria, Ghana, countries like that. And then finally, he said, and the, the outer circle is ringed by yet another circle that's pretty much everywhere else in the world, the expanding circle, where English is widely learned as a foreign language. And the examples he had were China, Russia, Germany. So um, that's, as I said, the, the, the model is sort of, you know, it, it's a bit dated now, but um, it certainly gives us an idea of how to think about different spreads of uh, different waves or different types of English, how English is used in different places. Um, it also actually maps quite neatly on the waves of spread because English, of course, as I said, it didn't, um, 
it didn't spread simply by a population increase, it spread um, significantly through colonization. And so we can actually distinguish three waves in the spread of English that, as I said, partly map onto um, the circles that Kahu identified. So starting in the 17th and 18th century, we see significant settler colonization out of England. And um, that brought England, uh, English, the English language to North America, to Australia, to South Africa. So um, the first kind of wave in the expansion of English is that settler colonization. And um, parallel to that slightly later, Britain also started to become an extraction colonizer and um, uh, Extraction colonies, in contrast to settler colonies, are those where you don't have a large um, population from the center moving, but where um, you know all kinds of goods and resources are extracted from the lo local population, usually under a, a military occupation. And um, extraction colonization, as you says, gave us the the British Empire and um, brought English to large parts of Asia and um, Africa in particular. Finally, with the end of um, colonialism in the 20th century, English didn't go away, although um, those places that were previously colonies of Britain and to a small extent with the exception of the Philippines, um, of the US. So those colonies um, became independent states in the 20th century, but that didn't actually stop the spread of English because by then um, US imperialism, globalization, the soft power of Hollywood meant that all those countries that had not been colonies of um, Britain actually also wanted to learn English and got in on the game. And so English um, became an important language that was taught in education systems across the globe. Now, what we are seeing in the 20th, uh, in the 21st century has slightly changed in that, um, of course, US power is on the wane too. At the same time, um, the spread of English hasn't actually slowed down. In a recent book about the effects of the pandemic, um, a British sociologist, Adam Tooth, speaks of the new world order as one of centrifugal multipolarity where um, the, the, the hegemony of the West, of um, the UK and the US that has characterized a couple of centuries now is actually um, going away and um, being replaced by um, other emerging powers, obviously China is foremost um, as the new emerging superpower or as, as a second superpower, if you will. So um, a, a world that becomes much more multipolar oriented to more than one centers, but at the same time also a world where um, the center itself can no longer hold and um, we, we see diffusion of power and all kinds of things. However, that kind of complexity and diffusion of power and, um, and, and whatever is emerging, one, one thing is clear that um, British and US power is on the wane, doesn't mean that English is also disappearing. And, um, one thing I will be arguing now is that actually at the current moment, English is no longer spreading with those countries that are traditionally associated with English, but with the power of um, countries in the expanding circle and particularly China. Before I do that, let me just give you a couple of numbers so that you I have, have an idea of the scale we are talking about. So um, where are those, you know, billions of English speakers today? 
the numbers you've got here, I've pulled them off Wikipedia. They're not necessarily very reliable, but I think they'll give you, um, and it's notoriously difficult to actually decide who is a speaker of English and who isn't. And um, what these numbers kind of try to gauge is people who use English on a fairly regular basis, as opposed to those who just learn English through the education system. If we added all kinds of learners of English on the globe, the numbers would be much higher. So we have the UK in the center. That's where English started from where it spread. Um, then we have large numbers of English speakers in those settler colonies that would also be considered part of the center um, in Cahu's model. So the US, Canada, Australia, South Africa. Then um, the countries that used to be extraction colonies, India, Nigeria, Pakistan, Philippines, Bangladesh, Ghana also give us large numbers of English speakers. And um, in green here, you see um, the large numbers of um, people, English speakers in what would have traditionally been the expanding countries. Um, as you can see, China is in fifth place. So um, the country with the fifth largest number of English speakers in the world today is um, China. The, the figure I've got here, 100 million, is probably an underestimate. Um, this is um, the estimate for people who regularly use some form of English in China. If we consider all learners of English in China, and that would be the whole student population, then the figure is closer to 400 million. So depending on how we do the counting, one could actually also argue that the largest number of English speakers today are in China. So what does that mean for the English language? Well, as I said, um, one argument that could be made is that Nowadays, the spread of English after centuries of the spread of English being driven first by um, British colonialism and then by US imperialism, one could argue that um, the fundamental change that we are seeing in the 21st century is that the spread of English is now actually being driven by China. And um, of course, also other countries in the expanding circle who are constantly expanding their number of English speakers. One person who explores this question, a researcher who explores this question in some detail in her new book is um, Professor Shang Ji from Zhongnan University of Economics and Law in Wuhan in her book about um, language policy and planning for the modern Olympic games, which I'd warmly recommend to you. And um, this book is also a really good introduction to um, how English has developed in China since um, the 19th century, in addition to being many other fantastic things. So um, let's just look at some of the domains where English is spreading. And as I said, I'm using China as an example here, but it could be other countries in the expanding circle as well, who all have, um, have never been colonies of um, an English speaking power, but are now pursuing English language teaching and English language learning with um, incredible force and passion to a degree that many people have been speaking of an English fever. So um, how is English spreading? Well, it's spreading through the education system. Um, in China, English has been the most widely taught foreign language in secondary and tertiary education since the opening up since the 1980s. It became mandatory in primary education um, from grade three onwards since 2001. So 
the, 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 the extremely large education system is really pushing English. Um, English has or had until recently a very important role to play in the Gakao, so in the university entrance exam and doing well on English. In English meant, you know, enhancing one's chances at um, to go to university. So of course that was driving a huge effort to learn English on the part of all those high school students who were aspiring to get good results in their university entrance exams. That in turn has been driving a fairly large private education market. Um, private education refers to tutoring, cram schools, all those after school and in addition to school opportunities that teach you something for money. And um, there are estimates that between 10 and 30% of the large um, private education market in China is actually solely devoted to the learning of English. And finally, within the education system, English is also spreading as a medium of instruction. English as a medium of instruction essentially means that content other than the language is taught through the medium of English. Um, again, since 2001, the Chinese Ministry of Education had mandate, has mandated that five to 10% of all university undergraduate courses should be taught through the medium of a foreign language. It's not specified that that is English, but in practice, it has overwhelmingly been English. And um, English as a medium of instruction is, of course, spreading in higher education across the globe. So extremely popular to study whatever economics, medicine, um, science, technology, engineering, and so on and so forth through the medium of English, because that is seen like, um, like creating synergies and, and a double opportunity to both learn content and learn the language. So um, a huge driver of the contemporary spread of English are actually education systems in countries where English does not have an official role. Um, uh, another domain through which English is spreading is, of course, business, trade, the economy. Um, China became a member of the World Trade Organization in 2001, is now the second largest economy in the world. And um, the, 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 export, the export nation of the world and the production capital of the world and all that export and trade and all these international trade relationships entail, of course, a lot of international communication and a vast chunk of um, global business is being done in English. So that's another driver for the spread of English. Science and technology constitutes yet another, of course, interlinked driver that spreads English. Now, science and technology does not per se favor English or um, favor the spread of English. However, there are incentives in place in the science and technology sector that mean that English spreads. One of these are university rankings that, um, you know, everyone wants to be in the top 100 or wants to increase their rankings. And um, one way to increase rankings is, of course, through internationalization. That means attracting international students. And that means often English medium of instruction. And um, that's through teaching. And then university rankings, of course, largely rest on research performance. Research performance is oftentimes measured through publications in international journals, in Scopus index journals, or in Web of Science index journals. Now, um, those 
international journals, pretty much all of them publish in English. And um, so to um, produce research that is considered world leading that will you know increase your research reputation that will that is considered as valuable you actually incidentally have to publish in english to a very great degree and um, finally, another driver for the spread of English from the expanding circle from um, the case study here from China is actually soft power projections, prestige, and um, the um, 2008 Beijing Olympics, which are the focus of Professor, Professor Shang's book, um, provide a really good example in that, you know, with the 2008 Beijing Olympics, China wanted to showcase to the world its, um, its rise and um, its power and its beauty and all its achievements and glory. And um, one way of doing that, of course, was again through the medium of English and how, um, how the country and, and particularly the host city actually rallied to provide a favorable linguistic environment for all those athletes and all those um, visitors is, is, is a truly amazing story to read about. So um, I'll recommend the book once again to you. Now, the spread of English doesn't just spread as a language, as um, you know, all the domains I've given you, that's about communication, but it, English is like no language, is a neutral tool of communication. Each and every language comes with a set of ideologies and beliefs and attitudes attached to it. And um, as I will show you now, many of the ideologies that spread with English. The, the language beliefs that spread together with the language are um, actually harken back to an earlier time when the spread of English was actually spread as a colonial and imperialist project of the West. Um, the way to research the ideologies of English language teaching is something that my team and I have been doing for many years. And we do that through studying um, English language textbooks, through um, advertising for English language learning and the linguistic landscape, how um, English actually becomes in English language learning, advertising for English language learning actually becomes part of the cityscapes of um, places around the world. As in the example that you see here on the image, um, an ad for Disney English, a private English language school on top of um, fashionable Japanese um, clothing retailer, all in one fashionable modern building in the city of Wuhan. I took that picture in 2012 when I had the privilege to visit. So um, on the basis of data like these from um, many different countries, um, not only China, we've recently completed two studies on English language teaching ideologies in, um, in Saudi Arabia, um, We've done studies in, related to um, also South Korea, Japan, Taiwan. So on the basis of these studies, one thing that emerges is that the ideologies related to English language teaching that spread with English are fairly uniform across the expanding circle. And um, there are five free beliefs that we've identified. First one is the, the idea that um, native speakers of English are the best speakers of English, and they also make up the best um, teachers. So there is a belief that though the um, English as it is spoken 
in the countries of the inner circle constitutes some innateness, some native quality. And um, those the people who speak English with the accents of um, particularly the British and American accent and learned it on their mother's knee as one of the definitions of a native speaker goes. Um, they constitute the best speakers of English. Now, if we go back to the numbers, of course, that's um, very far from the reality nowadays that actually the majority of English speakers are no longer native speakers. Another belief tied to um, the global spread of English is the idea that American and British English are the best English. So. Um, Again, it's this kind of origin idea where the language comes from, that's where the best form of English is spoken. Another idea tied to the global spread of English is that the younger you start learning the language, the better. So children are supposed to be the best language learners. And that, of course, ties in with the idea of nativeness, which is very often indexed by accent. So the idea is that a native speaker has a particular accent and that particular accent is either an American or a British accent. And um, accent is one of those aspects of language that um, become fairly immutable over time. So, um, and, and, and children are good at picking up accents. They're also very good, I have to add this, they're very good at forgetting um, languages again. So in terms of um, the actual evidence, who makes the best language learners, the jury is definitely out on the idea that children, particularly young children, do not necessarily make the best language learners in reality. However, that's not what we see in marketing discourses. And um, those marketing discourses really rest on the, on the, the feature of the accent. There is also the ideology that communicative language teaching is the best method. So um, this is often framed in opposition to grammar translation methods or um, to, to boring teachers who, um, you know, explain grammar and who don't know how to speak. So again, it ties in with the idea that oral fluency as presented by the native speaker is actually the best form of English. And um, communicative language teaching method is the idea that you best teach monolingually and um, through a kind of immersion approach. Again, the, the, the actual jury is definitely out on that. Um, it's not necessarily super efficient actually to teach a language through the medium of that language, because you're much more efficient at explaining things in the language of the learner. Um, however, the, the rise of communicative language teaching has certainly to do with the valorization of native speakers who usually don't as native speaking teachers usually do not know the language of the students they speak. So it's all kind of, they, all these ideologies are um, highly linked um, and they, they really become part of the ideas that language learners deeply hold. So I think that's um, important to understand about ide language ideologies. They are not necessarily about um, proof, about reality about rational explanations they are just um yeah they just believes really and um one thing i've been discussing this uh, a lot with my students of course one thing i i recently see emerging is that whenever i mention things in class like um and I have a lot of students um, from China, from Vietnam, whenever I mention things like, you know, English is now most widely spoken in China. China is one of the drivers of the spread of English and talk about things like, as I just did about um, English 
spreading through the Chinese education system, then um, my students would often come back to me and say, yeah, that's true, but we don't have an, a good English speaking environment and we don't really practice speaking enough or we are still lacking fluency. And so one of the things that language ideologies actually do is they, um, they create forever an elusiveness of the goal. They forever make actually good English out of the reach of the language learners. They can actually be quite debilitating in many ways. And finally, um, the fifth ideology of English language teaching that we've identified is this belief that English is a force for good in the world because it will lead to better intercultural communication and understanding. And um, again, I must say, ideologies have, have only a tenuous relationship with realities. But these kinds of beliefs, of course, come out of the colonial project that I explained earlier. But while the colonial project has gone away and while countries in the expanding circle have now adapted um, to using English to English language teaching are now driving the spread of English for their own interests, which, you know, are quite remote from, um, or oftentimes quite remote from the interests of um, the center country. What hasn't changed is actually the language ideologies that go with the contemporary spread of English, although it's driven by other forces. This um, can result in um, significant injustices related to global English teaching. And I've, I've written about those in my book, Linguistic Diversity and Social Justice. You can see the cover here. And basically we can identify five injustices of um, this immense drive towards English and this um, spread of English in every corner of the globe. The first one is that um, English is widely misrecognized as the high road to development. And by that, I mean that English language learning is very often driven by the idea that English will be conducive to development. Now, this is a misrecognition to the degree that um, we see developed countries using English. And then the misrecognition is that actually the language that these countries use is part of what has contributed to their success and their development and that development that using English will lead to development. Um, the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu has explained processes of misrecognition in great detail for individuals aspiring to improve their social position. And um, the same can be said for um, uh, the developmental projects of various countries aspiring to improve their position. Another injustice related to the global spread of English is actually that um, the spread of English can reproduce existing inequalities in education systems. Um, again, I go back for an example, I go back to the study by um, Zhang Jie, who um, speaks about how, or and, and also, um, my colleague from Yunnan University, Professor Li Jia, who've explored in great detail also on language on the move, how um, students in peripheral areas of China are actually disadvantaged by the um, emphasis on English because English is, you know, in, in most cases, English is more available to people in 
developed cities in large cities or um, people who just have greater so uh, greater financial capital to invest in tutoring, for instance. And so um, English education already needs resources. And if English performance on English language tests becomes one of the um, gatekeepers to um, you know, access to university, for instance, to access to higher education, to access to all kinds of social goods, then um, we are reproducing hierarchies where people who have um, better access to English, of course, also have better access to the goodies that education provides, whereas people in um, rural areas and peripheral areas or um, poorer people will have greater difficulty achieving not only accessing English language learning, but in particular, achieving the kind of English that is valued. For instance, um, getting a good accent for, um, you know, depends on actually being able to, a good accent, I should say in quotation marks, as per the ideologies I just explained, um, depends on whether you actually have access to, um, native speakers or technologies or private tutoring and so on and so forth. Another injustice of um, global English relates to the cost actually and to a significant financial transfer from um, all those peripheral countries to um, the center English speaking countries. And that transfer happens through um, purchasing educational materials and resources because of the ideologies I outlined earlier. Of course, textbooks that come from Britain or the US are seen as better textbooks. Um, the, um, another transfer, another tribute to the center, if you will, is through international education. And um, one way to get that coveted British or American accent is, of course, to actually spend some time in um, Britain or the United States as an overseas student, as, as an exchange student, and so on and so forth. All that actually brings a financial benefit to um, the center. And even um, outside the domain of English language teaching, if we go back to the idea that the best science is published in international journals, and the, the best international journals are mostly published in the UK and in the US, um, then um, of course those publications also provide a financial benefit to publishers in those countries. And um, that relates to another aspect of epistemic injustice that um, the knowledge, knowledge, global knowledge that is produced and circulates through the medium of English is somehow seen as more valuable than knowledge that circulates in any other language. And um, that, of course, makes us all very unequal knowers in that. Um, our, our ability to share knowledge, to be taken seriously, to be seen as credible and as um, authoritative depends on access to English. And of course, that is, that is deeply unjust. And um, finally, it may well be the case that these ideologies that I outlined to you earlier, together with the incredible pressure that many people in countries like China are under to actually perform well in English, is a recipe to inculcate some kind of inferiority complex. Because of course, um, as Bourdieu would say, everyone recognizes the value, the prestige accent, the prestige form of a language, but 
very few people can actually produce the prestige forms of a language. And um, that, that um, misrecognition of what is the best English together with the relentless pressure to actually speak English, use English, do well on an English test, prove that you can speak English, um, is, is surely not particularly healthy for anyone's mental health. Now, I've got an intriguing photo here on the slide of a car that is um, painted in the British flag in the Union Jack. And I encountered this car in the United Arab Emirates on a um, on a street in the Emirate of Ras Al Khaimah, which is also a fairly remote place in the overall scheme of things on this, um, on this planet. And um, to me, the car, the car is actually an, a, a driving ad for um, a British university that has a satellite campus in that Emirate, Ras Al Khaimah in, um, the United Arab Emirates and um, together with the um, with that satellite campus for which it advertises it brings together many of the um, many of the injustices kind of it visualizes them that I've just explained to you in including of course the misrecognition the um, link with access to education, the cost that you actually pay a British university to get that kind of education, the epistemic injustice in that um, knowledge becomes mediated through English and, and maybe also the inculcation of an inferiority complex in that it's just really strange to see um, you know, this flag driving around. If you want to read more about this example and how I came to it and, and how I interpreted it, there's a link here to the Language on the Move blog where I talk about it more. So that was um, the story so far, but are we actually seeing the end of um, English centrism? It could an, ar an argument could be made that many of the things I've been saying were true maybe until 10 or five years ago, but um, surely times are changing. Um, there's the obvious rise of China, but um, maybe more, um, more immediate, the pandemic in which we find ourselves and um, all these things together have certainly made many more people realize that the promise of English that is expressed through the language ideologies I explained earlier certainly does not hold. On um, the Language on the Move blog on um, our COVID-19 archives, you see the um, URL at the bottom of the screen. We've actually documented the language challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic since February 2020. And the photo that you see here is um, from a school in Pakistan, in rural Pakistan, that one of my students um, shared. And um, the photo is noteworthy because um, all the instructions on how to how to keep yourself safe, the public health communication is in English in an area of the country where actually very few people have any proficiency in English and um, where in fact um, literacy rates are relatively low. So although this may be some form of symbolic communication as um, it almost has a magic quality. It seems like, you know, if, if you say something in English, then um, that, that can keep us safe. However, in terms of practical um, communication, in practical public health communication terms, this is useless. Um, and as I said, much of the research that we've 
documented on the COVID-19 archives in places around the world has actually found that the reliance of English to communicate public health information in linguistically diverse contexts um, has certainly not been useful, has often been counterproductive. Um, together with Professor Shangji and Li Jia, I've also edited a special issue of the International Sociolinguistics Journal Multilingua, which you can see here on the screen, where we actually engaged with um, questions of the language challenges of the 19th uh, of, of the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, the special issue actually features research that is um, China-centric and deals with questions of public health communication in the Chinese context or in Chinese diasporas around the world. And one of the key findings is that oftentimes um, English what the, the idea was that within China, for instance, English would be used to um, address the um, health communication needs of resident foreigners, for instance. However, that was highly insufficient as many of the international students, for instance, um, in one study by Li Jia in, in Kunming, actually do not necessarily have a whole lot of proficiency in English either. So um, the, the research brought together there clearly documents the failures of the, um, of the high value we set by English and um, that many things need to change if we want to actually improve things like public health communication and ensure that in a crisis situation, everyone, irrespective of where they come from in our diverse societies, has equal access to the relevant information. This, together with um, a number of other developments, may well spell the beginning of the end of English centrism. So um, let me close by kind of looking to the future. What does the future hold? Um, I often, I, I teach a class on um, the history of the English language and my students often ask me, you know, what will English look like in 500 years? Because we look back and 500 years ago, the English language was so very different. And, um, you know, it's, it's hard to even recognize it as English. Even if you go back a thousand years, it's unrecognizable. And um, so what does the future hold? Well, there certainly is a lot of complexity in the future. Um, the image that I've got here is from a cartoon that has just, um, from an article that has just been published in the Journal of Sociolinguistics about um, fake ABCs in Hong Kong. And um, ABC, as you probably know, refers to American born Chinese and, um, is kind of a, an identity that is that brings together some of the ideologies that I spoke about earlier in uh, in kind of Chinese people in that um, you have perfect speakers of perfect American English who are native speakers yet at the same time they are Chinese. However, this valorization of ABC seems to be questioned now in Hong Kong in um, that there actually is an emerging social media discourse about how, how there is there, there are fake ABCs and um, how this pursuit of um, the perfect accent or the pursuit of, um, of a native speaker ideal is actually quite cringe inducing. So we see a lot of complexities and um, all ideologies are always highly contested. So beliefs about language are never static because beliefs about language are essentially social con uh, constructs and they serve particular social interests. And I've tried to explain whose interests the dominant ideologies of English language teaching 
observe. However, interests, of course, are never monolithic and interests are contested. And so, of course, we see change in language ideologies and um, we also see change in the domains where English might be considered useful, as I've just explained with reference to public health communication during the pandemic. Um, so maybe to go back to this fancy term of centrifugal multipolarity, maybe that's what we are seeing in the global language system. Maybe the pyramid is breaking apart and a pyramid is fairly unusual in um, the history of humanity um, before the ascendancy of um, European colonialism, the world global system was certainly much more diffuse and had multiple powers. So maybe we are going back to a system with multiple powers and um, how will that affect English? Well, one thing that um, Nicholas Ostler says in his book about um, the history of lingua francas is that lingua francas tend to live on for quite some time after the death of the empire that brought them to power. And um, his examples are Latin, which really thrived for almost a thousand years after the fall of the Roman Empire, or Persian, which served, which also thrived as a lingua franca in India and, and all across um, Southeast Asia. Um, or South and, and, and Central Asia for um, you know, hundreds of years after the fall of the Persian Empire. So um, it may well be the case that English lives on long after the fall of American Empire. And this brings me back to my very clumsy introduction. Um, even if English survives and you know, continues as the global lingua franca, the global language for centuries to come, it will not be the same English that we know today. Um, 500 years ago, as I said, English was very different, barely recognizable, and definitely not recognizable as the language that we know today as English a thousand years ago. Certainly with the sheer force of numbers that I've showed you earlier about how um, speakers from the expanding circles and particularly Chinese speakers of English are now making um, up such a large group English, even if it's still, you know, really important in 500 years, it will be a very different English. It will be an English with Chinese characteristics. Of course, it may also be that English um, gets supplanted by Chinese or Chinese becomes a second global language along with English. And in that case, um, you will need to get used to Chinese changing and becoming a language with English characteristics as um, people like myself try to you know, pronounce it. And inevitably, one thing that we know from the history of language that um, language learners inevitably adapt the language to their own uses, mangle it in many ways, but... Um, go on and um, contest it and speak to it at the same time. With that, I um, want to thank you very much for your attention and I'll be looking forward to your questions and comments in the discussion. Thank you very much.